final item of business is members business debate on motion 17505 in the name of Keith Brown on the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights Report. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Keith Brown to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A great misery has been inflicted unnecessarily, especially on the working poor, on single mothers struggling against mighty odds, on people with disabilities who are already marginalised, and on millions of children being locked into a cycle of poverty from which most will have great difficulty escaping. This is a reflection of the UN Special Rapporteur, Professor Alston, on the Conservative Party's appalling record in government. The report that we debate today explores the destitution, Tory austerity and universal credit has imposed on communities across Scotland and the UK. It is unconscionable that in a country that boasts the world's fifth largest economy and huge amounts of wealth, 14 million people, some one fifth of the population, live in poverty. Over 1.5 million people live in destitution. And that this has been welcomed by the ministers responsible as an almost unmitigated success. It is in fact completely immoral that the UK government has presided over the systematic immiseration of such a large part of its own population. Disproportionately women, children, people with disabilities, older persons and ethnic minority groups. In September, Presiding Officer, I hosted a summit in Alloa to assess the impact of universal credit on my constituency of Clipmanager and Dunblane. And from the evidence presented, it was clear that the Tories' flagship policy is a system not fit for purpose. An unnecessary five-week payment delay that sends people into spiralling debt, a cruel and inhumane sanction system that pushes people to the brink, and a toxic legacy of rising food bank use. The latest figures from Clipmanager Council show 85% of universal credit claimant council tenants are in arrears, totalling £550,000, despite doing all that is required of them. They still end up being six to eight weeks in rent arrears before the DWP make any payments. Stirling Council's figures show the level of rent arrears among tenants claiming universal credit has increased from 13,000 in June 2017, when the system was rolled out, to over 191,000 by April 2019. These unacceptable figures are representative of a fundamentally flawed system that traps people in avoidable debt. In light of this, what has not been surprising is the UK government's contemptible attempts to discredit Professor Alston and this report. Amber Rudd has accused him of showing wholly inappropriate political bias, while Philip Hammond rejected flat out the findings as a nonsense. And this stubborn denial to accept any kind of responsibility is matched only by that shown on opposition benches in this chamber. It should completely shame all Conservative politicians that the government has now accepted the findings in Professor Olson's report as factually accurate accepted that Tory policies have been directly linked to an increased use of food banks and an increase in the levels of homelessness and to have forced destitute women into sex work. Or perhaps it's a lack of shame that's led Tory politicians to stand up in this chamber time and time again. The Tory uh, Social Security spokeswoman defending the two-child cap, the rape clause and the bedroom tax. In fact, in fact, even denying that the bedroom tax exists at all discrediting the links between draconian sanctions and food bank use, and others writing glowing puff pieces on the unmitigated disaster that is universal credit. Senior Tory MPs have spent the weeks roundly criticising their own record in government, and it's not too late for their MSP colleagues to rediscover their shame and accept the harm these policies have caused. Professor Alston is right to highlight the ideological fanaticism the Conservative government has shown in implementing austerity, austerity economic policies, and pushing through with the deeply flawed universal credit. For what we have seen disguised as an unavoidable fiscal programme is a radical social re-engineering and the undermining of the social contract as we know it. For years we have seen the welfare state, the foundation of the social contract, attacked. Strivers pitted against skivers, while values such as freedom and individual responsibility are distorted to eliminate any responsibility on the part of the state to ensure the welfare of its citizens. But what it enables is the creation of an environment in which the vulnerable are viewed as undeserving of assistance. It also enables the creation of a welfare system that denies the most deserving their entitlements, that pushes disabled people into unsuitable work, and in which, as Professor Alston notes, British compassion for those who are suffering is replaced by a punitive, mean-spirited, and often callous approach. 
This radical transformation of the relationship between state and individual is an attack on our rights as citizens. And for what freedom is there in being trapped in poverty as a child, as a single parent, or someone with a disability? What freedom is there in being part of a social security system that appears designed to keep you trapped in that poverty? And I'm glad that this negative view of freedom, this entrenchment of poverty, is rejected by the SNP government, which recognises that it is the government's role to play a positive role in empowering and enhancing citizens' freedoms, and recognising that we as citizens have the right to expect a social security system that provides just that, and the responsibility to make a fair contribution to society through a progressive taxation system that many political thinkers have said is a hallmark of a democratic society. Taxation is not a burden, it's an investment in our future, in health, education and infrastructure. And it's investment that it can make empowers our citizens, strengthening their ability to take responsibility for their lives and liberating them often from ill health or from poor educational prospects or a lack of opportunities and it enhances their freedom. The difference between the SNP government and the Tory government could not be more stark, with both Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt having presided themselves over a decade of austerity, cuts and sanctions, now offering huge, cuts to the well, huge tax cuts to the wealthy. The Scottish government, for its part, spends £125 million a year mitigating that Tory austerity, rightly recognised by Professor Olson's report as unsustainable. For it is outrageous that a devolved administration must take action to protect its citizens from UK government policies, money that could be better spent supporting the work of Social Security Scotland, a social security system built on the principles of dignity and respect that rejects a punitive sanction system that has no other role than forcing millions into poverty. Using new social security powers, the Scottish Government has already delivered transformative new entitlements, supporting 77,000 young carers, 7,000 new families in low-income households, making more payments in the first two months than the DWP benefit it replaced made in a year. It will shortly take on further responsibility to provide disability entitlements and winter and heating assistance. And today we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary about the Scottish Child Payment. I would be interested to know when she replies whether she's received any assurances from the Tory uh, spokespeople that she's spoken to as to whether they intend to continue uh, with these benefits, this mitigation of the worst of the Tory government, if they were ever to get into power. The, government, the Scottish Government has also strengthened the social contract between the Scottish people and their government and all paid for by progressive taxation. And I wonder if any Tory members will stand up today and commit to these entitlements. What were they, Professor Olson described as compelling the plans of the Scottish Government to incorporate the Convention on the Rights of the Child into Scots law and also the recommendations made by the First Minister's advisory group on human rights leadership. That's the kind of action that government should take, improving the lives of their citizens and not impoverishing them. Adam Smith, one of Scotland's greatest philosophers, once observed that the true measure of a nation's wealth is not the size of the king's treasury or the holdings of the affl affluent flu, but rather the conditions of the labouring poor. And politicians across the UK would do well to remember this. It's our responsibility as representatives of the people to challenge inequality, to fight poverty and want, and to build a society that is fair, just and prosperous. It could not be clear, presenting officer, following this report, that the UK government is manifestly failing in this regard, and the Scottish Parliament must have the powers to create a fair and equal Scotland. The bedroom tax, the two-child cap and the rape clause have no place in a civilised society. No place in a society that treats all its people with respect and dignity, and it should have no place in an independent Scotland. We have a moral responsibility to oppose these measures, and the SNP will continue to do so. But before we go to the open date, it would be right to recognise that while this debate focuses on the UN report, these findings have been consistently raised by other organisations across Scotland and the UK for many years. The UK Government must end its stubborn denial and listen to these voices. It must implement the UN report's recommendations and it must devolve all, Scottish, all social security powers to this Scottish Parliament. I look forward to what I am sure will be a considered and thoughtful set of contributions from the members today. Thank you. Uh, we move to the open debate and speeches of around four minutes, please, although there is a little bit of time in hand. And I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. While there are many valid points in Dr Alston's report, I feel that there is a missed opportunity. A missed opportunity to have a rational, reasoned debate on the issues affecting the most vulnerable in the UK, and a missed opportunity to depoliticise what has already been a heavily partisan conversation. Presiding Officer, there is a common misconception surrounding UN Special Rapporteurs, namely that they are representatives of the United Nations. 
As Dr Alston himself has said, he is not a UN official. He merely presents his independent findings to the UN. And bearing that in mind, we should be careful not to conflate Dr Alston's report with the opinions of the UN. I feel it is also important to note that the UN have struggled with their relationship with rapporteurs and do not always agree with their findings. Philip Alston himself has recently come into conflict with the UN, as we saw from Ban Ki-moon's reaction to his work in Sri Lanka. But perhaps one of the greatest challenges, as with any piece of work, is ensuring its validity. Many of you in this chamber will have undertaken graduate and postgraduate work, and one of the first recommendations you receive when you embark on research is that your sources should be peer-reviewed. Sadly, the piece of work we are discussing here today did not enjoy such academic scrutiny. For example, by referring to the UK's budget surplus, or by Dr Alston's fundamental misunderstanding of the devolution settlement, the rapporteur does not help his cause. Neither has his hyperbolic language aided his case, and I believe the Secretary of State will be formally complaining to the UN to make that point. While it has been confirmed that the statistics contained within this report are valid, what has not been accounted for is that many of these publications are simply out of date, relying on figures and anecdotal evidence before 2017. I find it Excuse strange. me, Ms. Ballantyne. Mr. Arthur, would you stop shouting from your seat, please? Ms. Ballantyne. Thank you. I find it strange that Dr. Alston claims poverty is rising in the UK when we can see from the social metrics figures that the rapporteur relies on that poverty levels have remained on roughly an even keel since 2001. While Dr. Alston is right to highlight the funding that was cut from universal credit in the 2015 budget, there is no mention of the changes brought in both the 2017 and the 2018 budgets. I have made no secret of the fact that I would like to see funding levels restored to their pre-2015 levels, as I'm sure many in this chamber would agree. It is vitally important that we support the most vulnerable claimants to the best of our abilities. That said, I feel Dr. Dr. Alston should have accounted for just some of the recent developments that have occurred in welfare reform the economy and society as well, so I will raise them here. This year, 220 billion will be spent on welfare, and almost 10 billion has been injected into the welfare budget since 2016. Yes, okay. Keith Brown. Can I thank the member for taking the intervention? Just say that she spent the bulk of her speech so far in attacking um, the author of the report, the messenger. Does she accept the findings though, or the statement from the Conservative government that they accept that Professor Alston's report is factually correct. Michelle Ballantyne. I think I just did that. Yeah. It, you, you need to actually listen to what I'm saying rather than just working up a, a, an in intervention. So we've had the introduction of the national living wage, giving 2.1 million of the lowest earners a pay rise. We've had an extra 250, 250 million to support the child element of universal credit. And we've raised working allowances by £1,000 last month, meaning 2.4 million claimants keep more of what they earn. These are things that have happened that are not mentioned in Dr. Alston's report. Um, I've run out of time. I need to, to finish. Sorry, four minutes is not very long. Not only that, this year the UK had the fewest low-paid workers in 10 years. And according to the UN, is one of the happiest places to live, has record unemployment, and is a top 10 nation for social support. So I have to ask the question, how does that square with Dr. Alston's report? I'm not alone in believing the UK government's welfare reform policies are bringing some positive changes. Bodies such as the Joseph Roundtree Foundation have concluded that UC will reduce the number of working families in poverty by around 300,000, while IPPR have highlighted that universal credit could be the most cost-effective method of solving child poverty. This is not to say that governments should not and could not do more. As the Poverty and Inequality Commission have highlighted, governments need to be better at monitoring outcomes from their policies as well as their impact, and both the UK and Scottish government could improve their data collection to inform future policy making. In conclusion, presiding officer, Solving poverty and inequality is a duty of us all to share, and regardless of Dr. Alston's report, it is clear that there is still work to be done. Thank you. Bob Dorris, followed by Lynn Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking Keith Brown for securing this debate here this evening and for drawing to the Scottish Parliament's attention once more 
the shameful and the appalling indictment of the UK government's persistent and deliberate attack on the poor in our society, which is set out very clearly in the UN Special Report, Rapporteur's report, report. Much was made of the UN's relationship with its rapporteurs, but when you launch an independent report or an independent inquiry, it should challenge institutions. That's why you have independent reports, and I commend Professor Alston for his work here in exposing the shame of the UK government. The rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights, Professor Alston, was very clear, presiding officer. He stated, policies of austerity introduced in 2010 continue largely unabated, despite the tragic social consequences. He says close to 40% of children are predicted to be living in poverty by 2021. And during his summary findings, he finishes off by saying, absolutely damningly, of the UK government, a booming economy, high employment, and a budget surplus have not reversed austerity. A policy pursued more on an ideological than an economic agenda, making the poor suffer in this country as a political choice by the Conservative Party. That indictment of the UK government is backed up by this Parliament's Social Security Committee and a recent report on Social Security and in-work poverty. I'm privileged to chair that committee, presiding officer. We hope to secure Professor Alston's attendance at the Social Security Committee to discuss these matters further. We've already raised concerns, unsurprisingly, of the minimum five-week wait, often much longer to, to get universal credit. The 26% increase in the first four local authority areas that saw the rollout of universal credit, um, those rent areas really damaging some of the most vulnerable constituents that we all represent. The attack on pension credit for mixed age households, the application of sanctions, not just to those currently on universal credit, but the extension of sanctions, quite frankly, presiding officer, to the in-work poor more generally. So if the only part of universal credit that you're going to get is child and working tax credits and no other benefit, then you can still be sanctioned. That's a new thing, it's a damning thing, and that's a shameful thing. Uh, closing job centres, moving to digital by default, uh, the bedroom tax, the shared room rate, the attack on uh, housing benefit for under 35s, and we could go on. Our committee has deep and meaningful concerns in all these areas. Uh, now, hardly surprising then that the Scottish Government has estimated that up to 2021, £3.7 billion will have been taken from Scotland's most vulnerable people uh, because of UK political choices. Uh, now, I do welcome uh, much of the attempts by the Scottish Government to mitigate much of UK welfare reforms, but our committee recognises that can't go on forever, and there's an end point to that. I'm actually not going to list those, op those, those, those opportunities to mitigate, but a special mention of the announcement this afternoon in relation to the, 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 the child supplement, the, the child payment, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary said will be extended to up to 410,000 young people most likely to be living in poverty mm -hmm. to address child poverty and lift 30,000 children out of poverty. That's this Parliament taking a different approach. In the time that I have left, Presiding Officer, I want to talk about those who fall through the cracks of the good quality welfare provision we sometimes have with Glasgow City Council, Citizens Advice and others. Um, a, a friend of mine, Ali O'Kane, who runs a Facebook page, no one seems to hear contact me the other days. He has done many times in the past, but an individual that wouldn't go to a counsellor or a MSP or an advice service. Uh, the lady had no food, she had no electricity, there were significant welfare issues. Because of Alec and no one seems to care, I was put in touch with that lady. Uh, we got food provision, we got power put back on, and we were hopefully getting those welfare issues addressed. Uh, but it shouldn't have to be that way. It shouldn't take well well-intentioned individuals such as Alec and his Facebook page to draw that to the attention of politicians to act. We have to deal with this at source, and the source of the suffering is UK government austerity. And I commend Keith Brown for drawing that to the attention of Parliament here this afternoon. And I thank my constituent Alec for all he does to help vulnerable people in the constituents that I serve. The last of the open debate contributions is from Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and can I also thank Keith Brown for securing this debate um, tonight and highlighting concerns in this chamber about the findings of the UN Special Rapporteur for Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. I would use the term shocking to refer to the situation described in Professor Philip Alston's report. However, its contents actually come as no shock to many of us who have been warning about the effects of austerity since 2010. 
The report also reflects the findings of all the anti-poverty organisations in the UK and of numerous academic studies. What has been shocking is the dismissive response to the report from the UK government in spite of all the evidence presented and a similar approach seems to have been taken by the Scottish Tories in here. Keith Brown's motion notes the Special Rapporteur's view that the UK government has been failing to listen and is determinedly in denial regarding poverty in the UK and indeed their response to the report seems to confirm this. The rolling out of universal credit across the country has played a big role in the problems mentioned in the Alston report as has the dismantling of the social safety net and the rise in in-work poverty. An area of particular concern uh, must be an increase in those turning to what is described by Professor Alston as survival sex, and Keith Brown touched on this in his opening remarks. The very fact that a parliamentary committee at Westminster has deemed it necessary to launch an inquiry called Universal Credit and Survival Sex, Sex in Exchange for Meeting Survival Needs, should actually shame us all. This has nothing to do with women and, in some cases, men entering the labour market for work. It's about abuse, violence and humiliation. And in actual fact, we should remember that um, prostitution is on the Scottish Government's spectrum of violence against women and girls. Universal credit has been an absolute disaster with a particularly bad impact on women's lives. So, President Officer, while the Alston report does note the devolved administration's efforts to mitigate some of the worst effects of the austerity agenda, and uh, once again today, can I welcome the specific announcement about um, the, the fund for some children. But we could and we should be doing more, I believe, with the powers that we have. Keith Brown mentioned the mitigation of the bedroom tax, which the Scottish Government has done, but he also mentioned the two-child cap, which has not been mitigated, and I will continue to put the case that it should be. The report also mentions the provision of the welfare fund by the Scottish Government. Certainly. Bob Doris. Um, I, I, I thank Elaine for, uh, for, for, for giving way. I'm just wondering, one of the things the Social Security Committee found, and we pick, we pick and choose the things we mitigate, but the Social Security has agreed that it's just no longer possible to mitigate everything that the UK Government does. Would you accept that point? Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I absolutely agree that we cannot, uh, this Parliament and this Government cannot mitigate everything, but I do believe that the Government has been very, very keen to say that this is a despicable um, policy and that it's, it, that it's something that they've put high on the agenda and therefore that is why I continue to put the case that that particular policy ought to be mitigated, but I certainly do take his point. Um, the report also mentions the provision of the welfare fund by the Scottish Government for emergencies and hardships, and of course that fund is welcome, but it's not been increased since 2013-14. And that means a real terms cut of 3.5 million. And with the government having no plans to increase that funding between now and 2025, certainly at the moment, this will represent a real terms cut of 7 million by that point. Now, asked about the underfunding of the welfare fund last week, the First Minister questioned whether the Labour government in Wales had such a fund. So I would just like to advise the Chamber that they do indeed a discretionary assistance fund and their latest budget um, announced an increase to the funding of that. So, I think Scotland should um, perhaps follow Welsh Labour in this regard and make provision of funds to the very poorest in society an absolute priority. Presiding officer, I hope I get a wee bit extra time, but in bringing my remarks to a close, I do want to highlight the work of the SSAFA, the Armed Forces Charity, who are exhibiting in Parliament this week. I had a chat with them, and some of the projects supported include working with families with children with disabilities and supporting women and children in need of stepping stones homes as they escape from dangerous or abusive situations. Poverty and deprivation can and does affect the families of those in the armed forces and those who have left the service. We've got veterans sleeping rough, living in abject poverty, and there are veterans uh, nearly evicted from tenancies because universal credit payments have not come through. If I could briefly highlight the case of Walter Richardson, medically discharged from the forces, Walter and his family were facing eviction in Lanarkshire with council tax arrears and they were quite simply living in poverty. Presiding officer, there are far too many of these accounts in the UN report, in our newspapers and in our communities uh, in Scotland today in 2019 and it really is unacceptable. 
The work of SSAFA and many charities and public services across Scotland should be commended as they try to hold people's lives together in the face of increased poverty and further austerity. But we do need fundamental change. The UN report is damning about austerity and the rapporteur is equally so about the UK government's lamentable response, but outrage is not enough. This government needs to make tackling poverty even more of a priority, to turn ambitious words into meaningful action, to do everything with the powers we do actually have to stop poverty increasing across Scotland. Thank you. I now call on Aileen Campbell to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, like uh, others this uh, evening, I also thank Keith Brown for bringing forward this really important and timely uh, debate. And as I set out in my statement of 27th of November last year, the Scottish Government was pleased that the Special Rapporteur was able to spend two days of his UK visit in Scotland, hearing directly from people affected by poverty and meeting Scottish ministers, parliamentarians, government officials and representatives of civil society. That lived experience that he got directly from the mouths of people who are directly bearing the brunt of Tory austerity. Not anecdote, lived experience, the realities of what's happening in uh, Scotland and across the UK. And we welcome the Special Rapporteur's final report. It is an absolutely devastating analysis of the UK government's austerity measures describing the policies pursued since 2010 as retrogressive and in clear violation of the country's human rights obligations and clearly shows that there must be a change in direction. And in Scotland alone, we previously estimated that 3.7 billion would be cut from annual social security spending by 2020-2021 due to the UK government's welfare reforms. Now to put that 3.7 billion pounds into context, that figure is the equivalent to three times our annual police budget or the entire annual budget of NHS Glasgow and Lothian. Yet the UK government refused to fix the problems caused by their welfare cuts that have been articulated today. Or to coin a phrase as we've heard in the, in the past during similar debates, they refused to test and learn. And it means that this continued assault on welfare and continued benefit cuts make it feel like we in the Scottish government are fighting this poverty with one hand tied behind our back. Now, Michelle Ballantyne said today's debate and Professor Alston's report was a missed opportunity to talk uh, rationally about poverty. But I think it's quite the contrary. Professor Alston's work shone an independent spotlight on the politically motivated and ideologically driven attack on the most vulnerable. And the special rapporteur notes the devolved administration are spending considerable resources to protect people from the worst impacts but that these efforts are simply not sustainable. How can it be sustainable when what's been brought out of the social security spending is the equivalent of uh, NHS budgets for Glasgow and Lothian? But in 2019 and 2020, we'll, we'll continue to invest over 125 million to mitigate the worst impacts that these changes bring and to protect those on low incomes. And the Quality and Human Rights Commission welcomed positive policies such as our mitigation of the bedroom tax. And as a result, we have shielded the most vulnerable. The reductions in household incomes in Scotland due to the impact of tax, social security and public spending decisions is lower than in England and Wales. But ultimately, there is still a reduction. We cannot shield people entirely and the money that we spend is money we would much rather invest in lifting families out of poverty. Yep. Elaine Smith. Thank you. I thank the Minister for taking an intervention and I fully support the government mitigating the bedroom tax. But would you not agree that given the despicable nature of the rape clause, the two child poli cap policy, that that should be considered for mitigation as a special case? Aileen Campbell. And I want to get out of the fact that we don't and it's not sustainable to be mitigating everything. It's £3.7 billion is coming out of social security spending. We're already spending 125 to mitigate the worst impacts of welfare reform. I announced, uh, I published figures today about the totality of spending uh, to help and support low income families of over 500 million pounds. And I don't want to always be mitigating the acts of another government. I would much rather have the powers here to deal with the problem head on. And I think that's the real uh, disappointment that I have from Labour because while we have to kind of wait and have our fingers crossed for some time in the future, maybe perhaps having a Labour government to try and do some of this, 
I'd far rather we just had the powers here in this parliament for us to deal and tackle these issues head on and support the people who live in this country. But I know that that doesn't seem to be where some are, but we'll continue to do what we can with the powers that we have and continue to support and protect the people that live in this country to the best of our ability. And the Scottish Government agrees with Professor Alston's assessment that the UK Government must reverse the many policies that it has pursued that are increasing poverty and inequality, such as that benefit freeze and the two-child cap. His criticisms of universal credit reflect the numerous representations made to the UK Government by Scottish Ministers. The UK Government must take heed of this report and make the changes necessary to provide support to people and to actively take action to tackle poverty and inequality in the UK. Indeed, what changes have been made do not go far enough. They do not address the long wait for a first payment under universal credit, the two-child cap, and its abhorrent rate pause. And they do not reinstate the original work allowances proposed for universal credit. Professor Alston uh, described the recent changes made as a window dressing to prevent political fallout. And I don't think many of us in this chamber could possibly disagree. And as Elaine Smith and Bob Doris have also made clear, I think it is quite incredible that the amount of uh, disregard that Professor Alston's report has generated from the UK government, when in fact they should be utterly shamed by the misery that their callous cuts have caused. In Scotland, we regard confronting poverty as an urgent human right concern and one that requires priority action across ministerial portfolios and on the part of all state institutions. And while child poverty and in-work poverty levels are currently lower in, this, in Scotland and in the UK, it's simply unacceptable that people are doing all that society asks of them. They should never get out of the bit and to continue to have to live in poverty. And that is why we are not, as I said earlier today and in previous debates, sitting back and letting welfare reforms hit the poorest hardest. We are taking action. And in his report, as well as noting that the Scottish Government is investing considerable resources to protect people living in poverty, the Special Rapporteur referred to Scotland's own ambitious plans for poverty reduction. These plans are underpinned by our four official measures of child poverty as set out in the Poverty Act 2017, which are expressed as targets towards the eradication of child poverty here. And early today in the Chamber, I outlined the significant action we're taking towards genuine reductions in child poverty, including the introduction of the new Scottish Child Payment. And as I said earlier, by the end of 2022, the, the payment will be introduced for all eligible children under 16. We estimate that uh, around 410,000 children will be eligible for the payment, and it has the potential to lift 30,000 children out of relative uh, poverty and reduce the relative poverty rate by three percentage points. And by the end of this parliamentary term, nearly two years ahead of our original commitment, we will introduce this new £10 per child per week, which will be paid monthly to all eligible families and children under six. This payment will help prevent poverty for families just above the poverty threshold, but on insecure incomes. And this is a, stamp, a substantial investment in families most in need. And we also agree with the rapporteur's conception of poverty as a multidimensional phenomenon that impacts on the full enjoyment of human rights. And in Scotland, the government sees tackling poverty as part of its coordinated work to realise a vision of Scotland where every member of society is able to live with human dignity and enjoy their rights in full. And we're committed to protecting human rights, advancing equality and tackling uh, poverty. And the Special Rapporteur notes our commitment to incorporate the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into domestic law within the current parliamentary term. And as Keith Brown also said in his report, Professor Alston also described the recommendations made by the First Minister's advisory group on human rights leadership as compelling. And in her response to the recommendations, the First Minister endorsed the overall vision of a new human rights framework for Scotland to be delivered by a new act of the Scottish Parliament. And the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security will co-chair the National Task Force that has been established to take that work forward. So in conclusion, Presiding Officer, the Special uh, Rapporteur is clear that the UK Government has been failing to listen and is determinedly in denial in regards to poverty in the UK. But the same can't be said of us in the Scottish Government. We are determined to tackle generations of deep-seated poverty and will be ambitious and bold and radical in our approach. We will seek to pursue policies that are designed to respond to the needs of the people of Scotland. And as I said earlier, today really is the, t is the tale of two governments. We've got Child Poverty Action Group publishing report today around the impact, the devastating impact of the two-child limit, which has been stemmed from a decision from the UK government. On the other hand, we have the decisions and the actions that we are taking here in Scotland. The new Scottish Child Payment, which will lift 30,000 children out of poverty. A glimpse of what is possible with the powers that we have, 
But ultimately, what we want in these benches is to not just show what's possible with some of the powers that we might have. We want another Scotland. We want to create another Scotland, another Scotland that is fair and equal and uses the powers at our disposal, but doesn't have to mitigate the actions of another government. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed. <laughs>